Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Good morning, Hawaii. <laughs> it's 11 a.m. It's Think Tech. It's a given Tuesday. And Peter Rossig, a spokesman for Hawaiian Electric, and I were just discussing the meaning of the word kauna, which is an important word to understand the, you know, the cultural inside of, of the Hawaiian culture. Can you define it, Peter? Well, kauna usually is described as the hidden meaning behind a word or a phrase or an idea. Sometimes it's a sexual or, uh, or you know, relationship oh, yeah. term, I think. But uh, very often, it, I think it comes up in other, other meanings. A story you hear, and, you know, it's like a fairy tale has a, a surface meaning the children understand and a, another meaning that adults understand. And the kauna is the unspoken meaning of the, of the fairy tale, I think. Should I always be listening? <laughs> <laughs> you have to always be listening because, you, you know, we all think in different ways. And you have to be sure that what you're hearing uh, when you're listening is what the other side is saying. And sometimes, you know, especially in an, I think, I shouldn't be opining on this, but in an island culture, you know, you tend not to be very direct and blunt. So you tend to, uh, you know, it, it's like the classic air kiss where you kiss your friend on the cheek while you're making a, a nasty face. And <laughs> <It really is. laughs> so uh, I think, you know, in island cultures, Bob Krause always used to talk about this at the advertiser, uh, you know, people will not be so direct, they'll be circumspect, because if you insult somebody today, you're going to see them again tomorrow, and it might not go your way it's tomorrow. It's a small town. A very small town. <laughs> It's a great thing about Hawaii, you know, oh, it is a small town. It is. So, Peter, thanks for coming down on Election sure. Day. It's an important day. It's an stark day. We'll see you later. Uh, in the meantime, you know, I think it's very important to talk about the poll agreement All right. and how the poll agreement has changed. Yeah. Uh, you should tell them what the poll agreement is. You mean the one between the Czechoslovakians and the Poles? No, no, no. No, no, that's not the one. <laughs> so, uh, Hawaiian Electric and Hawaiian Telecom have come to an agreement which has been approved by the Public Utilities Commission. Uh, there are about 120,000 poles across the islands, not counting Kauai, uh, that are jointly owned. And they've been jointly owned or we've jointly owned poles for almost 100 years. But uh, this was getting increasingly complicated, and there's more and more things on poles. And uh, so we started talking to them some time ago about uh, us taking the ownership interest, we call it, or taking over the ownership of the joint poles. What, what did the poll agreement say? said basically that in order not to have a telephone pole and an electric pole sitting side by side, and then a third pole for whoever came along next, that we would have a joint pole, and the top wires almost always are the electric company wires. The next wires down below are the phone wires, and then uh, over time, cable wires and other things oh, yeah, have been sure, added there, sure. street lights and so forth. So, uh, you know, what was a fairly simple, straightforward system uh, got more and more complicated. And when somebody has, when there's an accident, you know, the television calls up and says there's a poll out and we have to look in the book and say, oh, no, you know, that's not our poll, that's their <laughs> poll and vice versa. There are a lot of complications that go with that, not least of which that in going into the future, there's going to be more things possibly on polls. New technology, 5G, uh, uh, network connections, and so forth. 5G nodes. Uh, yeah. That would go on the poles. On the poles, yeah, right. Yeah. So it would be a lot simpler for everybody if, um, you know, there was one company that owned all the poles and was the one stop, and you could always call them. And, you know, it's not perfect. The uh, Hawaiian Telecom still owns uh, about 20,000 poles on their own, or whatever the situation on Kauai is. City and county also have uh, some joint ownership through their street lights. We're going to work on that next. But by getting this all into one house, uh, we've gonna, we're solving a lot of things. And for most people, I think the primary thing is when you drive around the islands, you see these uh, big pole and then a stump uh, called a double pole. And what's happened is that for some reason, the electric wires were moved from the original pole over to the new pole. Uh, and then the top was cut off that stump because the other, other wires, uh, whether it's tele, uh, cable wires or telecommunication wires or whatever, um, were not moved yet. And sometimes they stay there for, unfortunately, a long time. They're about 14,000 of them around the and island. And they're bound up with the, the two poles are bound together in some Sometimes way. they're bound together, sometimes not. Sometimes they, they've had to reinforce the, the older pole. They're, they're not attractive and they're not useful and they just create, you know, two poles to hit with your car instead of one. 
So um, <laughs> the, we're going to be able to, over the course of the 10 years coming, we're going to be able to get rid of uh, those joint poles. It's going to clean up the environment. It's going to clean up, you know, the, the neighborhoods and, and make everything, you know, better looking. But more importantly, it will, it will streamline things and it will make things uh, less expensive, we believe, over the long run. You know, now you have to have two companies come and pull up a truck and do this and that. Maybe the first company has to come back and finish or whatever. Now, you know, we're eventually going to get to the point that one company will get out there and will manage everything. And uh, Hawaiian Telecom and other providers will have agreements to put things on the poles, but we'll own them, we'll maintain them, and so forth. Do you have to pay anything for this? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> nothing's free. Uh, you know, the, the no actual cash changed hands, but about $48 million in credit uh, goes to Hawaiian Tel, uh, from Hawaiian Telecom uh, that, you know, for past uh, expenses and for future, their sort of future rent on the poles, uh, and I, I don't know the details of how long that lasts or whatever, but basically, you know, nothing's going to move right away, and so they're going to pay uh, like any other provider will pay, and that lets them concentrate on their core business, which is the communications, uh, you know, increasingly wireless, but there's still wires involved and phone and so forth. And for Hawaiian Electric, it, it is going to save our customers money, we believe, and um, we see it as a way to, uh, you know, as these 5G things come in, that uh, it's perhaps a source of income that we can use to reduce electric bills, because at the end of the day, that's what we need to do. We need to reduce bills for our customers. So this is a very good deal. The PUC said, you know, wow, this is great. Both of us, of course, are, are uh, regulated utilities, so they had to approve, and uh, we've been in negotiations a long time. You'd think it would be simple, but nothing is simple. And, um, you know, we had to talk to the other uh, telecommunications people that are on our polls and say, here's what our plan is, and you will or won't be affected and so forth. But uh, I think it's, you know, you know it's going to be fairly invisible but uh, to most people, but in the long run, it's going to be a good deal for everybody. I imagine it's a good deal for uh, Hawaiian Telecom because, A, they could use the money. <laughs> right. And B, their, their um, what do you call it, their uh, dial tone is less than it was because people are relying more on sure. cell phones. Yeah, their, their business is changing, and, and uh, it just didn't make sense for, for both companies to have this, uh, you know, fairly expensive vested interest in, in these polls. And now they have a new owner, of course, and we, you know, we hope that that's the end of their, uh, you know, financial difficulties. But it has been, uh, a, you know, a struggle because of, of uh, you know, different priorities, I guess, between the two companies. And, very, you know, very frankly, most people, when they see a poll they're unhappy with, they call Hawaiian Electric. <laughs> and, uh, we, you know, we, we don't like to say, oh, but that's their poll, or we, you know. Uh, so this removes all that. We're responsible, and we're going to take that responsibility mm -hmm. um, seriously. And as I said, over, you know, it's not going to happen tomorrow, God knows, but over the course of the next 10 years, we are, we're in the process of an audit and of all these roughly 14,000 what we call double poles. This is on three islands. Uh, on three islands, right. Yeah. And uh, every place but Kauai, actually. So um, five islands, not, not Kauai. There's a different utility yeah. there, as you yeah. know. So we're doing this audit, and we're going to figure out, you know, are the, which poles are unsafe right now. We're going to do those first. We're, which poles are older, we're going to get to those sooner rather than later, you know, where, where older polls also means that our customers have been staring, looking at them for a long time. And uh, so we want to try to solve that for, for the people who's, uh, you know, been looking out their window and seeing this, uh, you know, not very sight, sightly looking. Well, <clears throat> are we, does this put us closer to underground? Uh, is there a plan there? Is this part of, the, you know, the, the deal? It's, no, not really. Uh, you know, undergrounding or overhead is, is still a basic question that has to be answered. Uh, I think we'll see increasingly undergrounding, uh, especially in new construction mm. and uh, certainly in areas in Waikiki and the Capital District and so forth. Uh, it's still a financial decision. Uh, undergrounding is very expensive right at the beginning. And, you know, there's some sense that over the 50 or so years of the service life of, the, of the, the wires that there's less maintenance. But, you know, we got flooding in Kaka'ako and a lot of places these days, so even undergrounding is no, you know, long-term guarantee. Uh, putting up a pole is not cheap, but it's not that expensive in the, you know, in the short term, cash flow and so forth. 
Uh, and over the course of the life, it probably is a little more susceptible to wind and, and rain and all other kinds of damage. So the end result, we've studied this a number of times because people are always asking. And, and the, the conclusion is that they both cost about the same over the course of 50 years. Uh, but the question is, where, when do you want to pay the money? Right, when and, does the 50 years begin? <laughs> yeah, when does it begin? And that's the other thing. You know, if we were to start to, um, first of all, it would take a, uh, if we were going to try to underground everything, uh, it would not be a, a Hawaiian electric decision. It would be a, a you know, legislature, governor. It would be a, a public policy decision. And then somebody would have to say, the first guys to get their wires undergrounded is you, and the last guy to get the, is their wires undergrounded is the you. That's a problem. And, and I'm not happy about that, because <laughs> I could be paying a tax or you know, whatever it's going to cost to do this, and it would be billions of dollars. I'm going to be paying it for 50 years before they get around to my neighborhood. Yeah. So you got to ask, you know, is that the best use of the money in a high expense area like Hawaii? Is that the, the way you want to spend the money? And how do you do it equitably? I think most people would agree that, you know, the beauty spots in Waikiki and things like that, uh, the coastlines ought to be, you know, among the first places. But uh, heck, you know, if I have a pole in front of my house, uh, I'm going to want it to be uh, undergrounded if everybody else is, and I don't want to wait 20 or 30 or 40 years. So it's a, it is not a simple problem. A couple of thoughts about that. I mean, one, yeah. I, I take your point about how this is not just a utility issue because right. there's so much money involved. It's very expensive to dig the trench, right. to put everything in there, to insulate it somehow, to, and then cover it up. Right. And my guess, um, I don't know the answer, but I guess... There are legal issues involved in that, you know, in terms of who owns the land and sure. whether the utility easement covers that. It would uh, be, a, a, you know, on all fronts, both on the technical front and on the physical front and on the legal front, it would be a, it would be a huge undertaking. And don't forget, uh, there's still going to be street lights. So there's still going to be poles that go up and have street lights yeah. on them. Uh, there's still going to be, uh, you know, traffic lights and all that sort of thing. So you're not going to ever have a terrain totally free of poles. But, and, you know, I, my thing, my guess is, and I read this in a book somewhere, uh, you know, for most people, if, if the pole is straight and everything is pretty neat, you kind of, <laughs> It's an aesthetic you know, question. <laughs> yeah, you don't quite notice it. If the pole is leaning and there's 12,000 things hanging off of it and a lot of junk, of course, you notice it. So um, I, I don't know, uh, I know there are certainly people who are very interested in having the, poles undergrounded or the wires undergrounded and the poles gone. But I think the majority of people, if you said, you know, is it that important to you? Uh, and uh, some things could never, you know, we have massive uh, 138 kV lines that go across the mountains and are held up by big, uh, very strong now, you know, we've strengthened these, these structures. You're never going to underground across the Ko'olaus. You're never going to, I've never, meaning, well, you know, within the foreseeable future. balance of equities, it's not worth it. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it's always going to be a compromise. And I think the present situation where some districts are required, capital district, as I said, in Waikiki and other places, new construction, uh, it's usually built into the cost of the, of the development that the developer says we're going to put these underground. We're going to have to dig anyway, so we're going to dig for that. And if any neighborhood really, really wants to do this, they can come to us uh, if they can find some funding or they can, you know, if it's worth it to them to underground in an area, we will talk to them and we'll tell them what's involved. And we, you know, we don't have any, we don't care uh, in, a, in a general policy way. Uh, so if, if uh, and there have been a few small neighborhoods, cul-de-sacs and so forth, where the owners of the properties all got together and said, let's figure out what this would cost. We figured it out. We figured out where the money was going to come from, a little bit from the utility, mm -hmm. a little bit from them, and so forth. And I don't know. I think there used to be some federal money that you could get for certain kinds of things. So, uh, you know, we're not, we're, we're never closing the door, but each decision is kind of, you know, has, has to be made on the basis of what makes the most sense mm -hmm. to us and to the Public Utilities Commission, because they have to, if we're going to spend money, customers' money on this, they have to say it's okay. And the consumer advocate has to say, this is fair to everybody, not just, you know, a good deal for these folks. You know, there was a, um, we're, we're, we're bound for extreme weather. Yeah. Um, no question about that. And, and there was a piece in the paper this morning uh, on inundation. It was very scary. It was, right. You know, all the low-lying areas were going to be covered. 
Yeah. And so I, I you know, I want to follow up on your point about, um, you know, flooding and the fact that underground poles can be inundated. You know? Right. So you get you get two you get two possibilities there. Right. One is if it's close to the inundation area or in the inundation area, I think I'd rather have the pole than the underground because I I want I want <laughs> power to be restored quickly. Right. Um, the other is, well, if we're going to have a windstorm, I think I'd rather have the underground than the pole. Right. <laughs> Any thoughts? Uh, my thought is, you know, I'd rather have the electricity on than off. <laughs> and uh, I think, you know, it, it is exactly that decision, that kind of, uh, you know, six of one, half a dozen of another. Uh, and, you know, depending on the location and how well it can be protected, if it's underground, how well it can be protected from flooding, you know, what kind of drainage. Uh, and, you know, those, it's also very difficult work. I mean, climbing up a pole in the rain uh, to fix an electric wire is no picnic. But getting down in a, a well, I guess we have to call them person holes in the dark, uh, you know, water up to your knees and so forth to fix an electric uh, connection is also very challenging. And, and, you know, so as I said, we don't have a, uh, a strong stake either way. We're trying to do what makes the most sense. Right. Certain areas, uh, I think you're right. It would be unwise, I think, to do too much undergrounding right now in Kaka'ako. Uh, it would be, uh, you know, just kind of asking for trouble. But you know, on the other hand, new developers go in, they want to do that. If they can create, uh, you know, there are ways to uh, make sure the drainage in these in these yeah, underground yeah. areas is, is good, but it all adds to the cost of undertaking yeah. I think the your job. your point is like everything else in energy, um, you know, the technology is changing. Right. Maybe somebody will come up with some solution that's less expensive, more effective. Right. And speaking of uh, more effective, we're going to take a one-minute break. Okay. <laughs> we're going to get effective after this one minute. Very good. We're going to come back. We're going to talk about the, uh, the new solar initiative with seven utility-scale solar farms. We'll be right back. Great. Hey, aloha. My name is Andrew Lanning. I'm the host of Security Matters Hawaii, airing every Wednesday here on Think Tech Hawaii, live from the studios. I'll bring you guests. I'll bring you information about the things in security that matter to keeping you safe, your coworkers safe, your family safe, to keep our community safe. Uh, we want to teach you about those things in our industry that, you know, may be a little outside of your experience. So please join me because security matters. Aloha. And aloha, my name is Calvin Griffin, the host of Hawaii in Uniform. And every Friday at 11 o'clock here on Think Tech Hawaii, we bring you the latest in what's happening within the military community. And we also invite all your response to things that's happening here. For those of you who haven't seen the program before, again, we invite your participation. We're here to give information, not disinformation. And we always enjoy response from the public. But join us here, Hawaii in Uniform, Fridays, 11 a.m., here on Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha. We are delighted to be here with Peter Rosick, a spokesman for Hawaiian Electric. Oh, gee, During the break, we talked nice. about life, a lifelong learning, okay? <laughs> Giving me goosebumps. <laughs> <laughs> I mean every word. <laughs> So we have a sign here that says, lifelong learning lives here. We also say truth lives here. That's the way it is at Think Tech. And um, you know, I, I just want to say that I, when I finished seven years of graduate school, I said to myself, that's it. I'm right. not going back to school. I did all my learning. I'm not doing it again. But I changed my mind. Peter. Yeah, you know, maybe we all have. There, I saw a quote that said, you know, in the future, illiteracy will not be the inability to read. It will be the inability to learn new things. Uh, everything, I mean, the world is incredibly changing in, for good and bad, as, as we know today on Election Day, we are hoping for the best. But, uh, you know, the new technologies, I had to go and look up what, what 5G is. So for our discussion about polls, I, you know, I've heard the term a hundred times, but I never, I never knew what the G stood for. So it's generation of, you know, internet connections. So uh, wireless connections. So. Uh, you know, if you're not learning, if you're not open to new thoughts, you're you're you must be dead. So. Especially now. Yeah. No, now more than ever. I mean, yeah. how different our lives are from what they were 20 years ago, from what our parents' lives were 50 years ago. Uh, incredible. It's just, I mean, it's exciting. Uh, in most cases, it's very, very invigorating. Yeah. But you gave me an idea for a new sign we have to have now more than ever. Now more than ever. Whatever okay. it is. Yeah, right. <laughs> Well, let's talk about utility-scale solar. 
You know, I always felt years ago, years ago, when you and I first met, I felt that the future was in utility scale solar, sure. and that the, the most efficient way to do solar was in large blocks and do it well. Right. And so, what's happening with the seven utility scale solar farms you guys are working on? Well, about uh, last February, we actually put out a request for a proposal, said we were looking for renewables, mostly solar, uh, for uh, on all of the islands we serve. And uh, more than 20 applications came in, and we picked the seven best that were in the final stages of negotiation. So we're, we're going to have seven new solar farms, we believe, assuming um, the Public Utilities Commission agrees, and we believe they will. Uh, three on Oahu, uh, two on Maui, two on, on Hawaii Island. And uh, first of all, you know, the headline is biggest infusion of new solar in the history of Hawaiian electric companies. 265 megawatts. 265 uh, megawatts. Some megawatts, right. But the really important thing is two things. First of all, um, the prices are very good. They are very attractive, and especially on Hawaii Island and Maui, those are going to be very helpful in bringing down their high energy costs. Well, it would seem <clears throat> that the cost of doing this on Oahu or Maui or the Big Island, it's all the same. <clears throat> Am I right? It's basically very similar. Land costs, shipment costs, you know, there's some small differences. But basically, uh, you know, the cost of a panel from China is the cost of a panel, getting it here, getting it installed. Once it's installed, it's very low maintenance, very few moving parts and so forth. So yeah, it, it is a very, in that sense, it's very attractive. And, and the costs for homes, uh, as we know, and for grid scale, uh, projects has been coming down. So the price is very attractive. And the final thing really is most important for all, th all three islands, each of these projects will have a battery, will have energy storage. So during the noontime, middle of the day, when, uh, when solar is strongest, it will collect energy. And if it's not needed, needed immediately in the grid, it will be stored. And it will be available at 5 o'clock in the evening when the sun has gone down, but most energy is needed. So from 5 to roughly 9 o'clock, uh, most of these things will have about four hours of storage. So they will be able to transfer. The holy grail of renewables is getting renewables from when they're plentiful to when they're needed. And this is going to make a huge step in that direction. Increasingly, every renewable project will have to have some kind of storage. But for solar especially, because it's so you know, abundant in the middle of the day from 10 to 2 or so, and then it tape, you know, tapers up, tapers <clears throat> off. But uh, it's create, that creates a lot of problems for our system, not just for customers and what they pay, but you know, at about 3 in the afternoon, all of a sudden, as the solar goes down, the amount of energy we have to produce goes up, call it ramping. And it goes up you know, in a radical way much more quickly than most of our generators are designed to, to move. Our, most of our generators are going to go inching up and then inching down. Then all of a sudden, we have these incredible ramps that we have to deal with. Does a peaking plan play into uh, this? Yeah, peaking, peaking plan is what you turn on to deal with the ramping in the traditional way. But if you have this energy in the batteries, you're going, you we're going to be able to control that ramping. And we're going to have, be able to avoid, um, you know, there are three kinds of plants. Base load on all the time, cycling, which you turn on, you know, which you increase and lower, and peaking, which you turn on at the very height of your demand. And that's the most quick response. Quick response, but also the most expensive. Mm. That is that is very expensive energy. It has to start up quickly. You have to have, you know, the fuel and so forth. So if we can avoid that and we can avoid ramping our cycling plants that uh, in such a fast way, I mean, they're meant, you know, if you drive your car normally, you, you increase the speed and decrease the speed. If you start revving it up and going, you know, from one to 60 in, in 10 seconds, your engine's going to be gone before you know it, right? And these are big engines. And if we have to continually ramp them in this radical way, it, it uh, takes the life out of their, out of them, and it, you know, voids the warranty and all those bad things. So this will be a terrific asset uh, for all the three islands, and, and the price is great. So on the Big Island, on Hawaii Island, where they have paid very high rates because their wind farms are, are still on contracts from avoided cost of oil. We don't do that anymore, but those contracts are still in force. All of a sudden, we're going to get a large infusion, about 60 megawatts on Hawaii Island, of uh, solar at a very reasonable rate, and we'll be able to move be it. a fraction of what it was before. Uh, it's, it's probably among the best prices we've seen for grid-scale renewables. Mm -hmm. So 
uh, that's very exciting. It's uh, it's exactly the fruition of you know what we were try have been trying to do and, and leading up to in, in the ten years or so since we really got serious about this. And, and one more thing, you know, we originally put out the RFP in, in February, I believe, and then came May or so uh, the lava and the, the eruptions on the Big Island and Pune Geothermal Venture, a 38 megawatt firm renewable energy plant had to close because the lava surrounded also it. Also unavoided cost, aren't they? Uh, partly, part of unavoided. They're more expensive. Yeah, they're more expensive, but their, their more recent contracts have been, uh, uh, have avoided avoided costs. But okay. at any rate, they're, you know, they're a very reliable partner and they tell us they're going to reopen and they've kept their staff on, on, on salary and they fly in people by helicopter to do maintenance and so forth. But in the meanwhile, uh, you know, we're not getting that renewable uh, energy into the system. And uh, so this and other plants that are being built on the Big Island will, you know, help to alleviate that whatever happens with Pune Geothermal Venture. And we hope they'll come back and, uh, you know, they said they will, and that's, that's the, what we're looking forward to. But we don't know when and they don't know. So this is uh, gonna be a big help on the Big Island. And the Public Utilities Commission, we went back to them after the uh, lava erupted and said, you know, can we modify our request for proposals? And you know, it's a lot of legalese, but basically said, we got to do more for the Big Island because of this situation. And they said, yeah, let's do it and, you know, let's move it along and let's expedite this um, so that we can get these very attractive prices. And one of the reasons the prices are attractive is there is a federal tax credit. Oh, if, right. the, if the it deals expires are- expires in a year or so. Uh, right? Yeah, it starts to decline actually at the end of this year. So mm -hmm. that's why we want to get these contracts signed, sealed, and delivered so that they can take advantage of that. That's part of the secret for getting these good prices. And you know, uh, I think what most people do not know, and that is Hawaiian Electric doesn't take a markup or on, on electricity we buy from a, a, a solar farm from a, a third company. So whatever we can get in terms of a good deal is what the customers pay, pass not a penny right more, along. pass yeah. it through. And you know, the, that's what the Public Utilities Commission wants us to do, that's what the CA wants us to do, and that's what we want to do. I mean, we're all paying, we're all customers of Hawaiian Electric. Well, it addresses that old issue of democratization. Because mm. if I have the money to put it on the top of my house, doesn't help the guy next door. Right. Uh, a utility scale solar farm helps everyone. Every single person, including the people with solar on the roof. And we're, you know, we're very happy, you know, we're, the 80,000 some customers have solar on their roofs, more power to them. We have just, speaking of batteries as we were, we have just uh, formulated a new program. So somebody that has in them uh, net energy metering agreement with our company, they want to, they want to add their own storage uh, and they or they want to add some panels depending on the size and the shape and so forth. Uh, they can do that without without voiding their original agreement. And that was you know the deal was if you come back uh, if you put on ten panels and you want to put on put on two more your old agreement gets thrown out. Well, mm. that's not a very good deal. And and now that storage is available in home and so these customers they're making their contribution to our so renewable energy. So they expanded by putting storage on, that's what yeah, they do. Yeah, they can, so they can do the same thing. They get the power in the middle of the day and they can use it at yeah. five o'clock at Let night. Let me ask you this though, Peter. Um, going back to the whole scenario about, uh, about extreme weather, mm -hmm. weather that could tear phone, uh, you know, power lines down, weather that could inundate, whatever, uh, and cause blackouts, because it happens. Sure. Um, <clears throat> Would I be better, wouldn't I be better off if I, if I installed on my house with a battery than if I relied on a big solar farm? Well, you know, the, that's one of the advantages of having your own solar plant on your roof with energy storage. You, uh, unless you have the energy storage, you, you can't use them. But if you do have energy storage in your home, uh, these Tesla wall-mounted batteries or, or some other arrangement, you will be able to keep power going. Uh, maybe not every bit you need, but uh, you know enough to keep much more comfortable. No question, if you can afford it, if you own a roof, if you can afford it, uh, you know, lots and lots of people at Hawaiian Electric have solar on their roof. <laughs> sure. Probably a higher percentage than the general public because, yeah. you know, that makes sense. If you can afford it, you have the home, 
you're in the right, the right situation. But as you said, you know, the guy next door who can't afford it or who is a renter, or like me, I live in a con, you know, in a high rise, I can't get solar on my yeah. roof. So I'm left out in the cold and we are gonna soon have community solar, which is gonna help that yeah. a little bit. Yeah. But that won't solve the problem you're talking right. about, you know, reliability in, in the case of really adverse weather. There's also a piece in the paper this morning about the Big Island and the, there's been a reduction in, in permits, you know, building permits for solar installation on single family homes. Yeah. So it, I think a lot of people cannot afford it or lost interest in it. And it's not something that we can predict will keep on climbing. No, I, I think you're right. And you know, we, about a third of people who have single family, own single family homes, have solar now. And that's a huge chunk, uh, you know, relative to a lot of things. So, uh, you know, we don't expect, we had this incredible rapid growth for a few years. Energy prices were extraordinarily high because of the price of oil basically in the Asia Pacific region and uh, panels were getting cheaper and cheaper and there were a lot of companies here who were competing to install solar and there was this kind of confluence of events that saw this very rapid rise. I think that's uh, calmed down and in any given month, you know, the permits may be up, the permits may be down. Over the, you know, over the course of time, we expect uh, the long range prognostication is for uh, rooftop solar, privately owned, to continue to increase. Yeah. Just not, you know, in a rocket ship, more, uh, you know, more in a long haul. Let's say about a show we did, uh, we, we were really out of time, but let me tell you about a show we did uh, a month or two ago involving some agency that was watching this. Guy was in Washington, and he told us that uh, <clears throat> they had made a study in Puerto Rico. And in Puerto Rico, there were utility-scale solar farms. Mm -hmm. uh, probably um, not the kind maybe that we would build, but they were there. At least two of them, big ones. And uh, what was really interesting is, is that they had one contractor build on this side, another contractor build on that side. And the fittings that were on this side were different than the fittings on that side. And when the winds came, this side was destroyed. Mm. <clears throat> the panels were ripped off the, the footings. Um, they were completely inoperable. On that side, they still worked. Wow. I mean, and the lesson to me is you can build it this way or, or you can build it that way. Right, right, right. Well, you know, the, it, it is not a simple undertaking. And, it, you know, these companies that do it uh, have to cost it out and so forth. But, uh, you know, we're, our, our terms require, we don't pay a, a contractor a penny unless they deliver electricity. So if they're going to build a system that's not going to withstand uh, some wind, they're going to be out of luck. Not, not Hawaii, you know, we're not holding the bag for that. Uh, so that's part of the deal. We want the, the best possible system. Uh, uh, but the, the crux is we're going to not pay more than a certain amount for the energy, and we're not going to pay anything if the energy doesn't come. So it's the, the contractor's responsibility to do a good job. And I got to say, among the 20 or so who applied, we have chosen the most reliable um, you know, some of the best companies that do this. Part of what you look at when you decide to do a contract is, have these guys done contracts before? What's their performance record? Are they backed up by, uh, you know, a big company or are they, you know, working out of their garage? And so I think, the, I think we have a fairly good assurance that the companies we've chosen are going to do a, a very good job. It's in their interest and certainly in our interest, but ultimately the financial responsibility is with them. Thank you, Peter. Peter Russell, spokesman for Hawaiian Electric. Great oh, it's to good talk to see to you. you. Okay. Aloha.